Good morning, happy Sabbath, everyone. It's deeper, it's wider, stronger, higher. Thank you so much, sister, for that ministry of music. Was that not a blessing? Praise the Lord for good, wholesome, gospel centric music. Really appreciate that. I do bring you greetings from the General Conference and the Adventist Review where I work with uh, Elder Bill Knott. Some of you may know him. Uh, working in what Elder Parker described as digital media. So I bring you greetings from them and from my family. So happy to be here with you on this Sabbath. Now, do you all mind if I come down to the floor? I, I, I'm never comfortable up here. Is that right? Everyone okay with it? All right. Just remember, I got permission. I'm never comfortable being so high up, feel symbolic, and I don't want to in any way portray myself as higher than anyone else. We're all in this together, amen? amen. Um, I want to say a word of thanks to, uh, by the way, I see a lot of my friends there, Tom and Sandra Nita in the back. Praise the Lord, good to see you. Um, friends all over the place. Uh, I've been up here a few times now, and I've gotten to know a few people. So I feel at home, as Dr. Parker mentioned. Um, now, what I'd like to do as we get started, if you don't mind, I'd like to go back to 2 Kings, chapter 20. And I'd like to ask you all to stand as we read it together responsively. Is that all right? I looked out amongst you as it was being read, and I noticed that some were just listening, and that was good. That was very good. But there's something else that takes place when you read it for yourself. God speaks directly to you, and I'm going to use it, and I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Is that all right? So we're turning to, where are we turning? 2 Kings chapter 20. And you're going to stand with me because we're going to read the exalted word of God. Amen? Amen. And we're going to pick up in verse 12. I'll start. At that time, Baraduk, Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present unto Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Okay, hold on a second, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. We're going to start again. You're going to read together, responsively, and we're going to be in one accord, reading the exalted word of God. Amen? Amen. And we're going to read it, read it like we mean it, like this is the Sabbath. We're going to read it like we have joy. We're going to read it like we, the word has power. Amen? So let's read it again. Chase the devil away when you read it. Amen? That kind of reading. Ah. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even from Babylon. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, 
Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As we begin, I want us to understand and consider this first, that when they came there to Hezekiah, to Judah, Jerusalem, what they saw, they took back with them. Let me say that to you again. Hezekiah said, everything that was in my house, they saw it. Isaiah the prophet comes and tells him, whatever they saw is going back with them. I began to consider, and I want you to consider with me. What if they had seen Jesus? What if they had seen the majesty of the universe? Would they have taken back something about Jesus to a heathen land? Let us pray together as we begin our study. Father in heaven, we're thankful, Lord, for your goodness, your mercy, and grace. Lord, we've all come here with an expectation. I've come with an expectation that you are going to do something special here today, that you would pour out your spirit that we may hear a word from thee, but nothing can take place unless we have your spirit. As the word of God tells us, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So Lord, we claim the promise together that if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more shall our heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask. And we are asking in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Whatever they saw, they took back with them. Now, I like to use my sanctified imagination. You'll indulge me, won't you? I imagine that all the things that had taken place there in Judah with Hezekiah went back to the rulers of Babylon. I mean, Hezekiah was a good king. He had a beautiful palace. He had all manner of treasures. And I imagined those in Babylon were hearing the rumors. And I imagined that one day they were saying, you know what? We need to send an emissary over to, to Judah to see all that's going on. Have you heard that the king of Syria, Sennacherib, he was threatening Judah to take the city. He was even, even bad-mouthing their God. We need to go and see this God. We need to go and see this king who had a God who sent, as the story goes, one angel who defeated 185,000 soldiers in one night. We need to go check that out. We need to go and see if it's true that this was a man who was dying. Anybody was dying? Anybody was sick here today? And God sent some healing to you? Hezekiah was about to die, and God sent Isaiah to him. We need to go and check this out for ourselves and see whether it's fake news. They wanted to know, was it true that he had this wonderful city where they had dammed up, dammed up waters, where the waters were allowed to go directly into the city? They wanted to know, is it true that he has all these treasures in his house? How are all these things taking place? And by the way, take a letter and let him know that we were aware that he was sick. So they came. Now, we read from 2 Kings. 2 Kings. But I want to go over to 2 Chronicles. The same story is there. It's also found in Isaiah. But I want to go over to 2 Chronicles because there's a, a bit more information. I love that about the Bible. How the Bible will give you a bit of information over here. Then it will add a little more over here. 
and you get a beautiful picture as you put it all together. Amen? Amen. And when you get over to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 32, there are a couple of things that I want you to notice. Verse 29, when you're there, say amen. 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 Verse 29, and, and then I'm going to read 31. It says, moreover, he provided him cities and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance for God. For God had given him substance very much, the King James says. Much substance, very much. Then verse 31 says, how be it in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, God let him, left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. Ah, so God was the one who arranged the visit. It was God who set this up, not really the king of Babylon. No, no, no. God set the whole thing up to try Hezekiah to see whether he would lift up God. Sanctified imagination. I can imagine. There was Hezekiah. He was so excited. These men coming from a far country, and they've come to see all that's in his house, all that's in his dominion. And I could just see him taking them from one place to the next, showing them the palace. Look at the wonderful church. Look at the tapestry and look at the artistry. Look at the gold and the the overlay of gold. Look at the, the flooring. I've got this from a mine where we mined it for marble. It's a beautiful marble. I can see Hezekiah being worn out, tired from taking them all around and showing them everything that's in his house. And then Isaiah coming to him and saying, what did they say? So Isaiah comes to Hezekiah and he's like, well, what did they say? And, and, and where did it come from? And what did they see? And I can just see Hezekiah just being worn out. He's weary. He says, oh, I showed them everything. Ah, they saw everything in my house. It was amazing, Isaiah. You should have seen it. It was beautiful as they were just amazed at all that I had within my house. Friends, as I speak with you today, you should know some additional details about me. I was in the television industry. I guess you can say I am again. But when I was a vice president at Turner Broadcasting, here's what I thought of myself. May I bear my soul? I thought of myself, I said, I really worked hard to get here. All those nights of reading those scripts and going over those storyboards and all the phone calls and all the meetings, I really put in blood, sweat, and tears over these last five years. I deserve, and I worked my way up to being a vice president of programming and acquisitions. It was easy for me to think as I sat in limousines and was traversed through towns and went from city to city and had all these experiences, it was so easy for me to say, I really worked hard for this. But it wasn't until I started working for the Lord that I realized something. We really have nothing to do with anything. The power of the gospel is when we realize the everythingness of God and the nothingness of man. Let me say that again. When we realize the everythingness of God and the nothingness of man. And every encounter that we have, Dr. Parker, is one where God asks us three questions. When you encounter someone, what will they say? When you encounter someone, what will they see? I consider this experience with you today an encounter. And I wonder, daunting, Scary as it may seem, what will you say? What will you see? 
It's interesting that no matter what, you're going to say something. Usually people will say something based on what they've heard. They'll say something based on what they've seen. So I'm having an encounter with you all today. I don't know where you've come from in that other question, but I imagine you've come from a variety of situations and experiences. You've come from discouragement. You've come from, some of you, from maybe despair. Maybe you've come from a place of where you're starting to doubt. Sadness, maybe. Maybe some disappointment. People will disappoint you, won't they? Especially in the church. Hello. So we've come from a variety of places. I don't know where you've come from, but you've come looking for something. I just want you to know that the only thing I want to say and the only thing I want you to see is Jesus. That's all. I want to be able to say, behold your God. Behold your God. Now, you need to know, as I began to study the life of Hezekiah, I began to, and we should do this, we should place ourselves right in the Bible and sort of almost like have a parallel kind of examination of what we're looking at. And as I was looking at Hezekiah, I began to think about my own life. We should do that. What have people been saying about me when they encounter me? You understand? What do they see when they meet me? Right? That's how we make Bible application to our life. Otherwise, we just can't just read the stories. They're not stories. God is trying to always speak to this heart. Amen? So as I began to ask myself these questions, what do people say? What do they see? I began to think about, well, where did Hezekiah come from? Well, I found out that Hezekiah was the son of Ahaz, who was a wicked king, an idolatrous king. Oh, he was into some stuff. And I wondered, how in the world did Hezekiah come from that? A king who took reign at 25 years of age, 25 years old, and he began to bring about all these reforms and all these kind of things, and he was considered a good king. So I thought about where did I come from? Oh, boy. Alcoholic father. Mm. See, I wasn't born in this church. So my family didn't know that you would abstain from alcohol. That was not on our radar. Alcoholic father. Violent father. I won't go into it too deeply. But sometimes I wonder, how did I get here? How did I get here? Oh, but the grace of God. It's nothing but the grace of God. In fact, I would even go so far as to say this as I take a sip of water. I'm a health reformer, you know. I would go far as to say I don't even deserve to be here. I don't deserve it. No. Didn't do anything to get here. There's nothing that you can trace in my background and say, oh, yeah, he went step by step, and he got his way to the general conference. There's nothing. I need to tell you that. And one day, I'm sitting in the general conference, sitting across from Elder Ted Wilson, and it hit me. How in the world did I get here? And as they begin to you know, when you, whatever takes place going back hundreds of years, you understand, whatever takes place in those meetings is recorded for records, you know, and it goes into the bulletins and, and you know what those meeting notes were. There's a record. And I'm sitting there and I said, boy, if I say something in this meeting, it's going to be recorded for history. So I started saying a lot of things. <laughs> But I wondered, how did I get here? Going back to those three questions, God asked, what did they say? Where did they come from? What did they see? You know, that second question is probably the one that we should tackle because the answer to it is found in the text, right? Where did they come from? They came from 
They came from where? They came from Babylon. And Babylon traditionally means they came from a place of what? Confusion. And that's what most people would answer. But we need to study that and go a little deeper than understanding or understanding of Babylon is not just confusion. Because it comes from where? The Tower of Babel, right? God came and confused their languages. Why did he confuse their languages? And therein will you find your answer. They were seeking to build a tower up to heaven and get there by their own, their own works, right? So God, because they were attempting to do that, he confused their languages. And thus we say when thinking about Babylon, it means confusion. But the deeper understanding is Babylon is a system by which you attempt to gain your own salvation by your own efforts or your own works. And it leads to confusion. That's happening a lot in many churches where people are attempting somehow to know more than this group and this group than that group and all these things based on their own works and their own efforts. But really, God is the provider and giver of all. Not to mention that he's the sustainer. Amen? Amen. So they came from Babylon, and then you can trace that on over to the actual place Babylon, which we find in Daniel. And we find that there was a king, a despot king, who said, look at this great city. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 30, that I have built with my own hands and all my glory for my honor. And what happened to that king whose name was Nebuchadnezzar? God confused him and he walked around or crawled around for seven years eating grass. Put him on a plant-based diet. Is that right? So Babylon is the answer. That's where they came from. They were a heathen nation. They didn't believe in the God of our fathers. They didn't believe in the God of the Bible, right? They had their own gods. They were looking for truth. What did they say? Well, I'm sure they went back and said, he's certainly got a lot of nice stuff. We ought to go get that stuff. But we ought to make this relevant. We ought to make this something that we can appropriate, something that we can use. We got to make it practical. So I started looking. I'm like, well, what are people saying about us? So I went to the Barna Group. You know about the Barna Group? 2017, they basically, the Barna Group, they look at all the trends in churches, all the things that are happening. And here is what they're saying about us. About half of Americans agree, either strongly or somewhat, Jesus was human and committed sins like other people. 52%. Now, why in the world would people have this impression of Jesus? Thankfully, 46% strongly disagree. But millennials, that group that's 34, 18 to 34, they believe Jesus committed sins at about 56%. That's a high number. That means that the group that's going to be the group that's going to take over the church is now in a place of total and utter confusion. God, Jesus, was just like us. Gen Xers, boomers, and elders are almost evenly split, similar to the national average. That means that everybody else down to seniors also are confused about Jesus. So that says to me that when they have an encounter with Christians, they're not really having an experience where they're seeing Jesus aright. Don't get discouraged, though. Many adults, still 2017, Barnard Trends, many adults believe they will go to heaven as a result of their own good works. Keeping the Sabbath? Keeping the commandments of God? Will that save us? Of course not. Of course not. 
But many adults believe that in this country, and it's even, if you dig a little deeper, it's even prevalent in the church of God, the remnant church, where we believe very subtly. I was just down in Florida, Panama City, Florida, and one sister said to me with tears in her eyes, if what you're saying is true, then you're saying that I don't have to do anything. In other words, she was saying, I don't have to do anything for my salvation. And that just sounds like error. I said, well, my sister, the whole Bible is built and predicated on the idea that Christ does it all. So I would even say what you see before you, as undeserving as I am, Christ has done it. Behold your God. In other words, what I'm saying is, behold what God is able to do. Does that make sense to you? What did they see? They say seeing is believing. And there's a close link between what we hear and what we, what we hear and what we see. One validates the other. Anybody remember silent movies? Don, you don't remember silent movies. Put your hand down. But they came up with what a difference it was when they actually added audio to it, to the experience. And the experience, of course, is much richer, right? So God wants us to see and hear. What did they see? As I began to look at the fact that it was one, two, three things, right? Having to do with seeing and hearing, I began to think about, not sure what happened here, I apologize. I had to switch it over to PowerPoint from from Keynote. When that happens, things get off. But I'll tell you what it says. Number one says the everlasting gospel to preach, fear, to give glory, and to worship. That's what you find in the first angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Amen? But it all begins with something that is preached. It is preached to the world. It is something that the world hears and then they will say it because they've heard it. And what will they hear? They hear the good news of the gospel, the everlasting gospel. Who here knows what the gospel is? I'm convinced that we don't understand fully the gospel message. And I go to places and people, and I ask the question, well, what is the gospel? And people say, it's the good news. And I say, this is the good news about what? Jesus, Jesus is our Savior. I get lots of answers, and that's kind of a pat answer. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1, 2, 3, 4, it says that the gospel was preached unto us, which we received, how Jesus died, how he was buried, and how he was resurrected. And then Paul says, and I am not ashamed of that gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. First to the Jews and then to the Greeks. And then he says, for therein, where? Therein the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. Oh, I hope someone's listening to me today. See, what the world needs to see is the righteousness of God. Not, listen, the, not the righteousness of man. People know what men are like. And if you don't know in 2018 what men are like, you have been sleeping. I don't know in my 52, 50, 53, ooh, 53 years of living if I have seen the condition of mankind and this world as bad as it is right now. I've never seen anything like this. But the world knows what man is like. What the world is starving for is a picture of Jesus. The world is dying to see what is God like. And no one, save Jesus, has ever revealed what the Father is like. Wouldn't it be amazing 
If one of us, any of us, all of us in this sanctuary could say when people meet us and have an encounter and they say to us, tell us what Jesus is like. And we could say, well, when you've seen me, When you've seen me, you've seen what God is like. Yes. Is that possible? Yes. Oh, you got some looks on your face, boy. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Let's keep going and see if it's possible. But as I saw those three questions that God asked through Isaiah to Hezekiah, and I believe he asked of us, I began to see a parallel to the first, the second, and the third angel's message, tipped off by the fact that they came from Babylon. Whenever you see Babylon, you need to know that God is taking you somewhere because it is the place that he used then, uses now. It is throughout. There is a common thread, and it always means the same thing, and you need to be able to be directed to this core understanding of what Babylon represents. So there's a link. So the everlasting gospel is that Jesus died, was buried, resurrected, ascended to heaven. Woo! I said ascended to heaven as a brother, as your brother, as my brother. And he sat down on the right hand of the Father. And now when the Father looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees Jesus. Somebody ought to say amen about that. Because that idea, that's amazing. That kind of love still amazes me. Because Jesus is there talking about you. There's any, not that the Father could ever be confused, but if there's any idea that somehow you or I are not worthy, Jesus points to his own hands his own feet and he says they're worthy Rico is worthy and he's there now you never have to worry not until Michael stands up as long as he's there interceding for you and interceding for me and as we shared last night because he died he had written a will and because he died you're in his will Nothing can take you out. Oh, lad, you should have been here last night. As we talked about the fact that dogs have been in people's wheels. Leona Hemsley, who had a Maltese. I don't really know what a Maltese is, but it sounds cute. But it must have been really cute because she left it $12 million. And then there was another woman who left her dogs $14 million. And no court system, listen, no court system could say, she's crazy, take that dog out of the wheel. Do you know why? Because once a will is signed, someone's last will and testament, once it's signed and that person died, you cannot revoke it. This is the power of the gospel we say we believe in. That you're in that will and no one, no one can take you out of it. The only thing that will take you out of that will is you say, I don't want it. But Paul says nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. That's a superlative. So you wonder, with that kind of love and that kind of, that kind of righteousness that's bestowed, that is imputed and imparted to us, who wouldn't want that? When those men came from Babylon and they saw uh, the power of God, that when God sent one angel, when, he, when they saw that Hezekiah and his army did not have to lift a finger, when they saw how God had blessed them with flocks and herds and gold and silver and all these things and this beautiful city, how could they go back and say, we don't want that? 
unless they appropriated it all to a man. That's the only way. Because if man did it, we can take it. You catch that? If man is responsible, man can take it. But if God did it, who can snatch that out of God's hands? You see the importance, the value of giving all honor and glory and credit to our God. That's the third angel's message, really. What man would worship that after seeing the true? Who would worship the false when you've seen the true? The only way people will do it and think that Jesus was a sinner if they, is if they only have seen something that's not true. Some things that's not real. We're told in first selected messages, the time of test is just upon us for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun. And notice what I've highlighted in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. Today, if you've never heard it before, the loud cry of the third angel in the revelation of Christ has begun. And that revelation is simply looking at what man cannot do and appropriating the majesty and power of grace in taking a man from down there and putting him in places where no one could ever have imagined. It has begun in your understanding of the nothingness of man and the everythingness of God. There was a man who was hearing a message similar to this. And this whole idea of you can merit nothing and the nothingness of man and, you know, all these things in 1888 that caused a stir and upset a lot of people. And he heard the message. He was a faithful Adventist, 40 years in the church, a good and faithful elder. But he was upset with the message. Normally a gregarious, very extroverted individual, he left the church quiet, silent that day. Had nothing to say. Usually stuck around and had some conversation about something, but not this day. And he went home, and as his wife was preparing a meal, he sat there quietly, just brooding. Until so finally he spoke up, and he said, if that old preacher is correct, everything I've done for the last 40 years means nothing. And his wife said, that's right. And he was quiet for six more weeks. He could not understand how sending his kids to Adventist schools, how teaching Sabbath school, how all the times he had shown up and opened up the church, checked the locks, he had done all these things, and yet here he was being told that none of it counted for anything. Couldn't accept it. Friends, this weekend, the greatest revival experience we can have is simply understanding the righteousness of Christ, the beauty of our Savior, and all that He has done, will do, can do, can only do. In fact, when the question was asked, what is justification by faith? The answer came, and it's recorded in Testimonies to Ministers, page 456, and it says, it is the work of God. The work of who? In laying the glory of man. Where? Don't get upset about being laid in the dust like they did in 1888. They didn't like that. They did not like the idea that God would lay their glory in the dust. Their Sabbath school teaching, their Christian education, their working for the church for all these years. They could not accept that all the evangelistic work was being laid in the dust. But let me just assure you, God does some amazing stuff with dust. In fact, he'd rather use dust. 
You hear what I'm saying to you? All of this dust came from dust. So be assured that he'll make something great from your dust. But it says, it is the glory of man. It is, the, it is that justification, it is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for him that which is not in his power to do for himself. That's what it is. The third angel's message is what God can do, not what you can do. The moment we get that, I tell you, there's a statement that says the moment we get that, the devil, his power will be broken and we'll be going home. You read it in Jeremiah chapter 23, 5 and 6, or Jeremiah 33, 15 and 16, how Jesus is the branch and he is our righteousness. He's everything for us. A few more statements and then we'll close. For it is the work of everyone to whom the message of warning has come. To lift up who? To lift up who? Oh, you sound like you don't like saying his name. To lift up who? To lift up Jesus to present him to the world as revealed in types, as shadowed in symbols, as manifested in the revelations of the prophets. See, the same theme goes through it. Ellen White was asked... Ellen White was asked a question. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. She said, it is in verity, in truth it is. And the third angel's message, justification by faith or righteousness by faith, is simply this, friends. It is simply revealing Christ to the world. After you have... accepted the gospel, lived the gospel, embraced the gospel, the world will look at you and they'll say, I don't want to receive a mark. I'd rather know your God. This is making sense to you. Amen. See, we often look at time, but the Bible tells us in Revelation that there shall be time no longer. There are no more prophecies that are based on time. The only thing that God is waiting for now is... The revelation of Jesus Christ and his people. That's it. Okay, let's make it practical. I don't like just throwing out theological stuff. Make it real simple. It's when we manifest to the world one word. And these are not my words or my understanding. I get it from the spirit of prophecy. When we begin to manifest kindness. See, we don't have to be all theological. Kindness. When I talk to you today, I want to show some kindness. When we have conversations at fellowship, let's just have kindness. Smiles, huh? It's simply that. Because Jesus was kind. And I'm finding as we wait longer and longer for Jesus to come, the less we are kind. And we see in the Bible that unless that spirit is manifested in you, you are none of his the Bible says. So the world should be able to look at us, experience, experience us, encounter us, and say, boy, they are the kindest people I've ever met. They are so kind. I was telling Dr. Parker as we were at Bob's Big Red Meal, whatever it is over there, as I was talking to the store manager, I said, that man's a Christian. I didn't know it. I said, when I say it to you, I said, that man's a Christian. And wouldn't he wasn't an Adventist, so don't get upset. But I said, that man's a Christian. Why? Because he was so kind. He was so loving. And then as we talked a little further, he said, yeah, my church down the blah, blah, blah. I said, aha. Uh-huh. See? So now I can come and tell you all, when I encountered him, what did he say? What did I see? Where was he from? Behold your God. We often think that the judgments are going to be poured out, but the Lord of God, the Lord God of heaven, will not send upon the world his judgments for disobedience and transgression until he has sent his watchmen to give the warning. He will not close up the period of probation until the message shall be more distinctly proclaimed. 
yet the work will be cut short in righteousness. What righteousness? The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. Notice the last sentence. This is the glory of God which closes the work of the third angel. Close with this. And I'll quote it for you. You can turn in your Bible to Isaiah 40. This is what I've been talking about. You'll find in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 9, you'll find there the title for this sermon, Behold Your God. You'll also find in that same chapter in Isaiah chapter 40, you will find there the work that preceded Jesus coming the first time. That was the work of John the Baptist, where he said, I am but a voice crying in the wilderness. You'll find that there, because it was the work that preceded the first advent of Christ. But then it gives you, in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 9, it gives you the work that precedes his second coming. Where it says, O Zion, that bringeth good tidings, get ye up in the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings. Lift up your voice, lift it up with strength, and say to the cities of Judah, Behold, what does it say? Behold your God. Behold your God. Is that possible? As your final contemplation, is it possible that you could say, Behold your God, and not be pointing to a picture of Jesus or to the Bible but be pointing to yourself? Is that possible? Okay, I'll make it, I'll help you to understand with the story in closing. There was a dentist. Any dentist here? Any dentist? Amen. Amen. Dentist? Amen. We got some backup dentists for the story. Amen. Okay. Were you a good dentist? You a good dentist? Yeah? I talked to some of your, your patients. Um, there was this great dentist, amazing dentist. And he was in a town where he had a little bit of a problem. This amazing dentist who could do all manner of work was in a town where everyone had perfect teeth. You hear his dilemma? I mean, he could do some serious work, but he had nobody to work on, right? So anybody who ever came, they just came for the basics. I just need a cleaning. So there he was basically twirling his thumbs in his amazing office where he could do this amazing work. And time went on and on and on. Great dentist, no patience. Until one day, that fateful day when somebody from the town over yonder came to his office where in a town everybody had terrible teeth. Chipped teeth, broken teeth, stained teeth, cavities, you name it, they had it, right? So this one day, this one comes into his office. Oh boy, can you imagine the excitement on, for this dentist? He couldn't wait, and he starts to do his work on that mouth. Oh, boy. He started to do the drilling and the shaping and the molding and giving crowns here and a veneer there. He started doing all this great work. And before you know it, the man who came in like this, afraid to smile, comes out like this. And what do you think he did when he went back to his town He went to everybody, smiling like this, and he said, behold, your dentist. Huh? Now, what does everyone want to do? They want to go and see his dentist. This is what Isaiah 40 verse 9 is saying to us. Don't take it from my word. Take it from Christ's Object Lessons, page 4, 15 to 4, 16. Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming, is that anybody here? 
Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, Behold your God. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of what? God's character of love. Notice what it said goes on to say. The children of God are to manifest his or character in their own life and character. They are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. Anybody here experience some grace from God? Anybody here experience God's grace, that amazing grace? Well, friends, I'm here to tell you, as the one who probably shouldn't be here, but because of the grace of God, behold what he has done for this man. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you that your love still amazes us. We're thankful, Lord, that you can take the drunkard and change his life into something useful in your hands. You can take even the prostitute and change the life that she becomes something important in your hands. In fact, Lord, you say that you desire the ones like that than the ones who have never even fallen. Why? Because we are told that it is your glory to pardon the chief of sinners. Lord, we're thankful for a God like that. I pray, dear God, that what we have shared through stumbling lips might reach an ear, might reach a heart, and that we might understand not only the first, second, and third angel's message, but, Lord, more importantly, that we would make it practical and that we would know that every encounter comes with the question, what did they see in you? What did they hear from you? And, Lord, may we be able to show them Jesus. Is my prayer in his precious name. And all that agreed said amen. Amen. May God bless you.